our mics working? Is that working? Good, good, good. All right, okay. Hello? Yeah.
Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, uh, over there next, between Minda and the... Uh, so. Have you got any um, interpreters here? No one but is interpret? Okay, bon. Okay. Allow me to call the meeting to order, <laughs> if I may. Okay. Okay, good morning, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. <laughs> good morning, ladies and the one gentleman. Um, my name is Marianne Franklin. I'm co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. It is now uh, 10 past nine. We've all got through security. I'd like to call this um, workshop uh, to begin. It's entitled Refugee Rights and Emerging Technologies, Building Digital Futures for All, with a question mark. We have today a very high-level panel, and I'm very proud to say for the record that this panel is comprised entirely of women. So this is fantastic. Um, sadly, our UK government representative has taken ill. He is unable to join us. Uh, so uh, our governmental um, stakeholder community, uh, whilst they have the right to reply, are not able to join us. So um, as this is a politically sensitive issue, I would just note that for the record, if I may. Um, and we wish um, Andrew Toft a speedy recovery. So we have a small group here, and I'd like to just, um, before I'll introduce the panel, and then I'm going to ask everyone at the table just to quickly say their name and their affiliation so that we can have an open discussion. That I think would be very nice, and it won't take too long. Um, but just before uh, we get that started, I'd like to introduce uh, Astri van Dijk from the Google uh, Corporation. Thank you very much for joining us. It's our technical community voice. You're not expected to speak for all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Valentina Vale from um, Association of Progressive Communications, and we have uh, Jean Guo from Connexio in France. Thank you very much. And we have Ima Farrell from Amnesty International. Is that everyone? So that's, those are our appointed speakers. They'll lead in. Um, I'll give a brief introduction as to why we're here and how this connects to work that the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition has been doing. But before we go any further from um, Emo's left, let's just go around the table and say into the mic, if you need to turn it on, your name and your affiliation. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Salamata and I'm a student in communication. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, I'm Faith. I'm a youth representative from the Hong Kong Youth Internet Governance Forum. and. Uh, I actually, I have a, um, I run a student-led campaign that advocates for refugee rights in my school. Hi, I'm Estelle and I'm policy officer intern at the French Digital Council. Hi everyone, I come from Ecuador. My name is Daniela Viteri and I started on the youth uh, program, the Youth Observatory program. Hi, I'm Claire. I'm from uh, Paris Dauphine University. I'm a peace studies uh, student and volunteer here to take notes on panels. Hi, I'm Elena and I'm also studying peace at uh, Paris Dauphine and also a note taker for this session. Hi, my name is Jean-François. Um, I represent an organization called the IO Foundation. We work on digital rights and we are mainly based on Southeast Asia. Hi, I'm uh, Min. Um, I'm here representing the um, International Rights and um, sorry, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, and I'm um, currently the co-chair with Marian. Hello, everyone. So my name is Ludivine Piron. I am a project manager for the Association Expat France, which, which is an NGO fighting against sexual exploitation of children, and we implement projects about refugees. So that's why I'm here. Well, this is a fantastic range of interests and a very strong representation of youth. So again, I'd like to note that for the record. I think I'm very... Oh, we haven't had everybody speak, have you? Sorry. I'm waiting because you... Yeah. Hi, I'm Alex Walden and I'm with Google. Oh, we've got two Googles. Fantastic. Great. Oh, two Googles. <laughs> 
Okay, look, um, I just want to uh, uh, just start uh, formally a little bit, and then I'll uh, explain why we're here. Um, it's estimated that today over 65 million people are refugees or internally displaced people, and this is from the UN High Commission for Refugees. Another recent report, and there have been many, uh, which is looking at how internet and mobile connectivity can improve refugee well-being. Uh, and transform humanitarian action, this report found that internet access has become, and I quote, as vital as food, water, or shelter. This is on record that the most important non-food item that people take with them when they're fleeing their home, whether that be from war, famine, natural disaster, or global warming, these days is their phone. Um, the so-called refugee crisis highlights the fact that connectivity and accountability issues um, now are very much integ integrated in issues around dealing with first contact, the emergency levels of uh, human displacement, refugee camps, uh, the need to actually develop various sorts of tailor-made digital tools that can collect data. And I think we need to notice this about data collection, because I really want to flag that also if we can. In order to respond to these immediate needs, but not only immediate needs, but mid-term needs, and unfortunately for many in detention centers and camps, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, these immediate mid-term needs become long-term, lifelong needs as children are being born in these particular kinds of so-called temporary dwellings. So we have an issue here about where human rights online, which have been also recognized by the UN, how they uh, work or do not work in the case of anyone who's had to flee their home. And I'm using very general terms because refugee is legally a specific term. Those who are seeking asylum, those who are granted the status of refugee, and all those others who are not yet granted any status and in some political discourses are being labelled as unwanted terrorists um, um, and all sorts of other terms which I will not um, indulge in right now. So we have 65 million people who have, by international law, human rights. However, if they're designated as refugees, they also fall under the International Convention on Refugee Rights of Refugees. So we have a double problem here because other reports are showing News from the ground is showing that basic rights, which people assume, such as access simply to, uh, um, to be able to keep their phone, to be able to access social media platforms in order to contact family and friends, to download photos, to look at photos, the ability to keep in touch with their legal counsel, the ability to enjoy themselves has been withdrawn within certain parts of at least the Euro European Union, the UK and other parts of the world. In other words, you become a refugee and it appears de facto your rights have been become denied. I'm saying this because in fact this is actually uh, on record. So we have a difficult a task before us today, but not an impossible one about the way that these tools and social media platforms and the information and the entertainment can provide empowerment, can invite, provide enrichment, can provide hope and contact with loved ones, but at the same time, this double use, of, this double, double life of these technologies can be and is being developed to track, data mine, tag and label people who do not fall easily under the citizenship rubric. What happens if you are not permitted to be a citizen? So we are actually getting to the heart of human rights, not just as law, but as norms, as values. We're also getting to the heart of what is to be done. So I'm very, very happy today to have our um, speakers. We're following on, just to finish my introductory comments, from very powerful workshops we had in 2016 at the European Dialogue on Internet Governance, two workshops. We were able to bring um, in a number of uh, former refugees, former asylum seekers, who now want to be uh, regarded as newcomers because they're making new lives in their new countries. Some of them are working in libraries, some of them are activists, and they were able to let us know that these people have lives, they have hopes, and they have futures, and they have desires, and they're not all terrorists. So um, that was a very important learning point. Unfortunately, because of time, costs, and overheads, we're unable to bring um, anybody here today, and I feel that is an um, 
unfortunate, and we take responsibility for not being able to have their voice heard. They may be actually online with remote participation. We have some people working with grassroots groups there. So with now, without no more further ado, I'd like to open. I'll just let you know your order of speech, speaking, if I may. Please welcome, join the table. I think we'll start with Val Valentina Valle because Valentina has some um, visuals for us. Then I'd like to move to uh, Jean. And then I'd like to move to Astri. Okay, I'm just sort of thinking in terms, and then Imar. Okay, and uh, we'll have a first round, three minutes each. We'll see where that goes. Everyone at the table is welcome to contribute. And just before I start, very quickly, could you just tell us who you are and what your affiliation is, our three newcomers? I think I want to take the time to have your name and affiliation on our record. Thank you. So I'm Mohammed um, Farhat. Uh, I'm an Egyptian lawyer working with refugees. Uh, I'm working with the Egyptian Foundation for Refugee Rights and the African uh, Civil Society and Information Society. Thank you. And our, your colleague, officer? Yes, uh, my name is Emil. I work for the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Oh, welcome. Yeah. And um, maybe you should still take your jacket off at the back there. Would you like to tell us your name, your affiliation? Is that OK? Um, my name is Dowdy. Um, I w what, w do you want to know where? Just, just so we know who is in the room. Uh, okay. Yes, I work um, as a public policy analyst at a Central American organization dedicated to defend human rights in the digital environment. Thank you so much. All right, so let's start. Um, first round, two to three minutes. We've been, then we have time, even with the short time left, to have another round and some questions. Valentina. Okay, good morning. So, my name is Vale, and I work for APC. APC work, it's a, it's a digital, it's open. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, London, let's like this. Huh? I look very Star Wars, War Stars, whatever. So, APC, in APC I work with the women's program, I work on sexuality in the internet. But I had the life before APC, and my life before APC was working with refugees in a specific part of the world, the Balkan. Uh, it uh, changed my life, it made me learning a lot, and unfortunately it made me coming back to work with refugees a few years ago when we had again in the Balkans uh, a new refugee route that was the people from Syria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the world coming, and from Africa, because that was uh, through the Mediterranean, trying to avoid to drown in the Mediterranean, the biggest uh, cemetery we have on earth, and to come. So. Refugee, it's a very complicated uh, conversation because we try to dehumanize them. And then when I say we, I say we with this skin. This skin is white. So I want to take, and I think that there is a conversation that is behind everything, and it's the conversation around whiteness. Europeans do not talk about whiteness. They talk about uh, racism, sexism, but they do not talk about whiteness. And whiteness is at the core of why refugee people exist. Because I think that before talking about the technology of today, we need to understand the cause of yesterday. And that's what's called colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism now. So if we do not acknowledge the responsibility of the white European in colonialism, we cannot uh, talk about uh, what is happening today. Because states that today exist, exist because of the greed of white people and all the causes that uh, generate. Uh, the, the, I will not go through that, but I think it's important. Two, three years ago, we did, uh, I participated to an event, was talking about a tacit future, and we were analyzing the infrastructure of connection and disconnection. We were talking of drones, migration, and digital care. And if, uh, if we can scroll down just to see the full title, and I would suggest to you to just, uh, if you just, uh, um, she should. Club. <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, if you just, I just wanted to scroll a bit down so that you can see. If you just uh, search for this title, uh, you will see. Uh, what we discovered all together was a mixed group of people was that there is an infrastructure 
of data valence, surveillance through data, that it's really paid with tax uh, uh, money, with the money of the public, to surveil and to collect data about peoples, about the, the refugee to come. Because while people are moving from one place to another in mass migration, they're still not refugee. They are freedom of movement is what I enjoy every moment. It's what each and every of us had enjoyed coming here. But freedom of movement for, for mass uh, uh, migration doesn't exist. It's criminalized. So there is an infrastructure of data valence collecting with drone and monitoring each and every uh, step of the people and each and every uh, data about themselves. So their shadow is so, so heavy that it's a cloud that it's uh, uh, above us all. And, but when we go to the other side of the infrastructure of the connectivity, the infrastructure of care is fragile. Infrastructure of care, it's based on civil society organization, on activists that put Wi-Fi hotspot to help uh, people on the move to be in contact, in contact with their friends, with their family, to try to save their life. Because we need to be aware that people move not because it's a, uh, it's a pleasure. They might reach a pleasure. But when Afghan youth people walk by foot from Afghanistan to reach Europe, it's more than one year walk. And it's not the one year walk we follow on social media because there is one person that have decided to walk the entire world with a passport of privilege. So I think that it's important that we reflect on these two extremes on the polarity, how fragile the infrastructure of care that provides support and try to allow refugees and people on the move, let's call them people on the move, to continue to be informed, to understand where they are and how they can arrive where they want to arrive. It's very fragile. And then we have public-private partnership in a big camp. Camps are not a, a place of choice. Refugee camps are places that you cannot live. There are people that live in refugees camp. I remember Palestine, 67 was funded. I'm 51. I'm born in 67. I walked far more time than anyone in that camp. In that camp, we have public-private partnership. Public-private, it's a polarity. It's the big corporation and the government. Where is the civil society? Where are the citizens? Where are the refugees themselves in all this polarity? I think that we cannot have a bilateral partnership without having a third part monitoring it. It's not about, of course, that the civil society has not the resource, the skill, and the knowledge. But civil society should be the side uh, solidarity, and civil society means the refugee themselves, because they are the citizen and they have agency. Someone they walk from sub-Saharan to the future as far more agency than any of us that just go crazy if our plane, train, bus is late one minute. Thanks. Thanks very much, Valentina. You've put the, put, uh, thrown down the gauntlet. Um, thank you. I think we're moving now to Jean. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just. Uh, so um, I'm happy to be here today and exchange with um, everyone and present a little bit also the work we do at Conexio. So our mission um, at Conexio is to make sure that um, those who are most vulnerable, including refugees, have um, the opportunity to um, have access to digital uh, skills and rights. Uh, for us, um, I can start with some of the facts that we see um, and some of, you know, we do studies, you know, within the students that we've worked with and then and also just, you know, there's a lot of data outside as well. Uh, we find that um, up to one third of disposable income uh, amongst refugees is spent just on connectivity. So to pay for phone plans, to pay to have access. Um, if you ask them, you know, what is the one possession that you can take um, if, you know, in an extreme circumstance, a lot of them will say, you know, my mobile device. Because for them, that is connection to the world, connection to resource, con connection to information. Um, and then just within the student population that we've worked with, um, three quarters of them do have smartphones. Um, and you know, I'll get into maybe the different levels of usage um, of you know what the functionality behind uh, is as well. 
Uh, but I think for us what's important and you know I'll go into some of the important distinctions and then into what I think are like three I think key rights uh, we should have with um, you know in regard to uh, what you know refugees should have in terms of their digital rights but I think the first one is to make a distinction between usage because I think oftentimes when we think someone has mobile connectivity they're connected that's great but I think we also need to go into the nuances and realize that there are different levels um, even within some of our students for example, um, who are um, you know uh, a little bit older, um, they you know only use the smartphones for you know to make calls. They don't use that you know for maybe researching the most information. They don't use it in the same way um, a young 20-year-old person might. And I think there's obviously you know there are differences in that. But I think the first is to make a distinction also between what layer um, and to what extent people are really u using that. And when we you know ask questions, when we do surveys, I think there needs to be a little bit more nuance into um, usage as well not just are you simply connected but in what ways are you using um, those types of services and those connections um, second I would say that um, I think there's also um, a lot of um, you know th this has been something that's also been thrown out when I've attended conferences and other things but it's also really important to t start talking about you know as you, you were mentioning as well protection of personal data um, for example we were at a uh, hackathon recently in um, you know based in Rome at the Vatican where one of the issues they were working on was migrant rights or migrant refugee rights um, and then there were um, individuals you know groups who had come up with devices or they had come up with um, applications they built at the end of this hackathon that were supposed to um, really think about you know how can we you know hack solutions but I think a lot of that I think needs to come along with the first layer of also of education and information that some of the information you are able to um, you know provide uh, needs to really go through a layer of is would this put someone in danger, for example? Um, they, there was, for example, an application about you know, facial recognition where they would take photos of someone and try to match that to find and um, you know, reunite family members. But I think there is a layer of data privacy and there is a layer of data protection that needs to also be thought out when we develop solutions. And also, I think um, you know, we attend hackathons, we attend these conferences where you know, some of the goals are to create solutions, but there also need for sure to be people who are there and who've gone through those experiences to tell them you know what is important to really take into account what are the dangers and risks um, associated with connectivity um, and I finally I think some of the um, regard to some of the rights I think there are three key ones for us the first um, is the right to have um, you know to information to know you know for example when our first uh, students so we're uh, based here in Paris we work with um, you know hundreds of students here um, in the local communities and the first one is to make sure that they have um, you know a right to information to know where they can go for basic services to where they can find shelters to where the um, NGOs that work with them on the ground are when they can find meals um, you know clothing donation I think having them be connected um, is very important the second is um, you know education also to go a little bit further and just the mobile connectivity um, and think about uh, what's available as well we talk a lot about you know upskilling today and for us part of um, a core part of what we do at Connexio is making sure that through um, digital skills, digital literacy, um, we inform and also upskill individuals to be able to, you know, kind of make that bridge towards long-term um, integration. And so giving them opportunities to gain these skills where they become productive members of society and really work um, in the ecosystem to um, stay in, to actually be fully integrated is very important. Um, and the last one is also um, for us, you know, that's a step further for um, those who do obtain asylum and do have the opportunities is really to open up more um, opportunities for them to have professional integration. Um, in France, um, unfortunately, there are barriers in the labor market that make it very difficult for certain individuals um, to be able to access that because, you know, for example, when we talk to a lot of companies, recruiters, they say, uh, you know, uh, because we, we don't think they uh, speak French, and then we also get a lot the question, are they able to work? Um, and we, you know, it's for them, we wouldn't be sending them candidates if we knew that they had the legal status necessary. But I think there's a lot of doubt. Um, and I don't think that's just you know, representative of the community here, but also probably of other uh, communities as well, where that is always called into question. But providing more pathway for them, because um, the brick of professional integration is also, um, at the same time, social. It opens you up to another network. And then also economic, in the sense that if you're not able to earn a stable living, you're not able to go out and meet people and really part of the community. Thank you very much. Very informative. Thank you. And 
and, uh, and uh, inspiring. Thank you. Now we're moving to um, Astri van Dijk from Google. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Astri, for being here. Okay. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for including Google in this panel. And um, to, I'm glad that you brought up partnership immediately because that's such a huge part of how Google is contributing to this massive problem and to, to finding solutions. And I'm eager to get into the conversation about data and protection and integrating refugees. But I just wanted to start with some basics about why Google is, is part of this important conversation. And, and thank you again for including us. Um, Google's basic business mission and function is to provide information. And um, through our basic product search, but also maps and translate, and um, that's the heart of what our, our business is, is providing information. And we are committed to doing that for everyone. Um, and that's um, in our 18 to 20 years of, of, existing, of existence recently, we've been really evaluating what that means and for the most vulnerable um, and the most, and most broad, how we can make our products accessible for everyone, including refugees. Um, since 2015, Google has been providing uh, support for 800,000 refugees, which sounds small compared to the overall numbers we're talking about, but um, uh, through a few different ways in terms of access to information. So immediately, right after the crisis, um, as you mentioned, people want their smartphones. So some of our basic products, maps, um, making low bandwidth maps so that, um, that you didn't need a lot of data to have maps. Um, we have a tool called People Finder to help people find each other through um, when they're you know, uh, displaced. Um, Google Translate is also a basic product that was we found we could immediately deploy and, and improve in low bandwidth environments. Um, so those were some of the things that we did immediately in 2015 as the crisis was emerging. Um, in addition to that, we provided access to some of the camps um, and Chromebooks um, through partners. We work a lot with NetHope, with IRC, um, with another organization called Libraries Without Borders, and Chiron. Um, the other, in addition to access, educational resources. Um, we found were really important a place where Google could add value. Um, the, we found, and I'm really interested to hear your perspective a few years later, but that um, when some of the refugees were actually getting education or taking classes, there was no um, way to get credit for that, and so that you would sort of lose a whole generation of, if, even if they are taking classes. So online was a space where you could have accreditation and have um, organization of the, of the education that they did get. Um, so that was a, a way that we found we could partner and provide value. And I think that we're um, committed and to, to finding solutions to this massive problem. Um, and that's, we think technology can provide help and find solutions. And um, moving into the massive power for good that we think data can have. And of course, there's huge other elements to that discussion in terms of protection of rights and protection of privacy. But we found in many, um, we are finding in a number of global challenges such as famine prediction or health, the, the power of the data we can find to, to predict patterns and then therefore find solutions is an incredible opportunity for society. And um, we all need to be a part of getting that right to help solve the problems without you know, downsides to privacy and, and, and rights. So um, uh, we'd love to talk more about AI and how that, um, in this panel, and how that can, can help. And then another part of, um, the discussion from Google's perspective is, as you mentioned, integration. And so um, a lot of what we're doing on our, a variety of our platforms, but in particular YouTube, which Google owns, is to uh, provide a space for what we call counter narratives, or positive narratives about integration. And so lifting up voices um, on the internet. So to counter some of the more negative, you mentioned terrorism, but that w narratives that are out there. So finding people, refugees, voices. Um, we have a program called Creators for Change, where people within the community that are trusted, lifting up their voices in both online and in person, having summits around Creators for Change all over the world um, to, to provide. We always think that the, the best solution to sort of negative, hateful narratives is more narrative. 
and positive narrative. So that's another part of the discussion where we think Google can add value. But thank you for including us. Thank you very much. Discussion. Thank you. Very informative. So turning now to our final formal speaker, which is Emer uh, Farrell from Amnesty. The floor is yours, Emer. Thanks for being here. Thank you, and, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so I work for Amnesty Tech, which is the technology and human rights program at Amnesty International. Um, I wanted to start off by saying something positive, but actually I was going to quote from the UNHCR report that Marianne already quoted for us, so unfortunately you're going to hear uh, perhaps more of a, a negative perspective, but I will end on a positive note. Um, so we've heard many examples of tech for good and how technology can really be used to improve the lives um, of ref refugees and migrants, um, but I think it's also really important to look at the need to not do harm in this area. Um, so maybe if I could first focus on that part and just to say that, um, the f so you probably know this quote from William Gibson, the future is already here, it's ju just not very evenly distributed. But actually I think the future is already here in refugee camps and re reception centres around the world. Um, because I think what we're seeing there is the testing and trialling of technologies um, on very, very vulnerable populations um, and where there can be quite serious, uh, sometimes life or death consequences um, for individuals. So we do need to approach these questions with care. Um, and um, so to maybe give some background on why Amnesty is interested in this topic. So at UN level this year, two very important global compacts were negotiated, the Global Compact on Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees. Both of these included language around data and around biometrics. Um, we, together with a number of other NGOs and humanitarian um, organizations and NGOs, advocated for improved language around privacy and data protection um, in these areas, especially um, in the case of biometrics. Um, and what we're seeing increasingly is the use of technology and biometrics um, around border management, uh, around my, uh, management of migration flows, and around management of life and registration in the camps. Um, so what we are advocating and have been advocating is a human rights-based approach to the use of these technologies. And that means looking at questions such as participation um, of the people who are affected, um, equality and non-discrimination, um, and I'll explain why those are important, particularly in the context of biometrics in a moment. Um, also transparency, right to remedy, um, and accountability. What we realized um, during our advocacy efforts were that actually not so many NGOs were looking at these questions. Um, and so what we're hoping to do, and we're really at the very early stages of asking these questions, um, is to start organizing a coalition of groups of interested uh, actors in this space to start trying to unpack and understand what are um, the gaps in knowledge um, and what can we do in terms of having more practical information and examples of implementation um, and what the, the risks and the harms are um, and also proposing other alternative solutions potentially. Um, so some of what's driving this, so um, we have, we're seeing politically the securitization of immigration and migration. Um, we're seeing a drive towards using technologies, towards innovation in humanitarian contexts. Um, and we just need to bear in mind that digital transformation is not only about tech. Um, so there are other aspects that we need to be paying attention to. Um, where refugee camp camps become testing grounds for these technologies, it's not a marginal issue. So once these technologies, for example biometrics, have been tested, they are often then rolled out in other contexts. So we're seeing governments around the world implementing national ID systems, um, and in some cases, uh, for example, with the Aadhaar system in India, we've seen quite um, serious privacy challenges to those. Um, so just to say that this actually is a question that affects all of us. Um, and we also need to, um, so digital identity in particular, um, there is momentum towards providing digital identity um, and that can be a good thing in, in many contexts. Um, it can give refugees and migrants access um, to important services, 
um, that they need. It can em empower them in various ways. Um, but um, digital identity, ideally we need to put this in control um, of the people whose identity it is. Um, and there is a push, so at UN level with SDGs, uh, one of the SDG goals, 16.9, um, aims towards digital identity for all um, and as a result we're seeing many technology companies and vendors entering into this space and pushing certain solutions which um, may not really have been tried and tested um, so I think we just need to exercise some caution um, in this area um, so what we really want to do is look at how um, how refugee camps are really becoming labs for some of these um, experiments, for some of these technologies. Um, and um, so um, also looking at, in many cases, in the camps, governments are partnering with private sector organizations. Um, often there isn't much transparency around the type of contracts that are in place, the types of data sharing agreements, um, and we don't always look forward to what potential uses of this data might emerge in the future, especially in a context of convergence of technologies and potential linking between data sets. Um, so I think one thing we would be interested in doing is trying to create some transparency um, around the contracts that are in place. There have been audits of the World Food Program um, biometric system and also of UNHCR, those audits were independent and were also quite critical. Um, also, um, just to remember that the private sector, so states obviously have responsibility in, in this area, private sector um, are also responsible, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights um, outline a lot of those responsibilities. Um, but we can't, um, so the business model um, for some of those private sector organizations may be quite different um, from the government, what the government might intend or what the humanitarian organizations might intend um, with the data storage and how it is used um, afterwards. We don't know how secure some of the data storage is. Um, so with UN biometric data, this is stored centrally. Um, the biometric samples are stored centrally in a database in Geneva. Uh, it's also stored in the cloud, but often there isn't really sufficient training um, of the staff who are doing the uploading. Um, and so there are, there are potential security risks around that. Um, from the perspective of surveillance, so these are obviously very vulnerable populations, uh, often fleeing on the basis of their identity. So their identity is critical uh, to their protection. Um, and governments, we know anecdotally that in numerous cases in the camps in Jordan um, that the government has been putting pressure uh, on the people managing the camps for access to that data. Um, again, anecdotal evidence of refugees being tracked afterwards and we also know that has happened in other countries. So we would like to explore this more um, and it would be great to have your, your views and your inputs. Thanks. I'm very um, substantive contributions. We have about 15 minutes. I was just wondering, is, um, we'll open it to the floor. Uh, comments brief, please. And it would be good if you have a question. Uh, we're trying to come up with some concrete action recommendations out of this workshop because this is the third workshop we've hosted. And we'd really like to have it on the record of the IGF. This is what we're asking governments to either acknowledge or to do. This is what we're asking uh, the, technic the tech community um, and this is what we're asking civil society groups to do. So this is our challenge today in 15 minutes. But before we get there, we've got 10 minutes of questions or comments from the floor. I believe we have some remote participants. Is that correct? No? Just checking if there are. Do they have any comments? Okay. Just let them know they can comment. Anyone from the floor like to make a comment? Please. Thank you. For the record. Yes, uh, Emil from the Danish Institute for Human Rights, um, and I'm super pleased that the UN Getting Principles were just uh, mentioned now, uh, but I kind of want to direct the question to Google, but also perhaps to, to the other panelists on, well, first of all, if Google actually, when you, when you develop your, um, you said the people finder, for example, do you already, maybe you're not the person to, to uh, to ask, but uh, do you already have kind of a human rights lens when you develop these programs uh, as a start, or is it uh, some more your internal 
ethical kind of um, um, uh, standards. And also for the other panelists, do you think to have a human rights based approach to kind of all these technologies is a good start and not go with the kind of uh, all Facebook mantra of move fast and breaking things that rather slow it down and, and start with thinking about what are the consequences as a start? Can we just gather some questions, but um, yeah. summing it up, so slow tech. Yes. <laughs> okay. So a couple more, thank you, or will, before respondents, could we have a couple more questions from the floor, just because of time? Yeah, please. Thank you. Mm, hi, so I'm Faith. I'm a representative from the Hong Kong Youth Internet Governance Forum. So. Um, uh, from where I'm from in Hong Kong, even though it has one of the smallest refugee populations in the world, um, the acceptance rate for it is very, it's astonishingly low. It's the acceptance rate for refugees is only 0.6% compared to some European countries where it's 75%. It's a huge disparity. So, um, and also um, because not as all asylum seekers are granted refugee status in Hong Kong, then um, they're only granted about $3,000 per month, which I think is completely inadequate for them to obtain basic necessities. So um, in terms of that, I think the government, um, a lot of times the government might not be doing enough for refugees. So um, I would just like to know, like, for um, to a question to all the panelists, um, how would you um, collaborate with the government? So what specific methods are you going to implement um, in collaboration with the government to ensure that the rights of these refugees are protected, like and in in terms of digital rights as well. Thank you. Well, that's the big question. So bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question from the floor. I think I saw another hand somewhere. No. Oh yes, one more. So oh, over that way. Yes, go for it. But two more. Yeah. Oh, so go please. Sorry, it's not, it's not really a question, it's much more a remark, because I heard that, um, I think it's uh, f from Google, you, you told about uh, the positiveness of narratives that we can find on YouTube. I just would like to mention that we have like a negative aspect of these narratives uh, from our association, because we know from our experience that narratives can be used uh, by traffickers, for example, to attract people from Nigeria, for example, to France. Uh, you have like girls saying that France or Europe in general is wonderful and that you can find work everywhere, etc. Then they are moving, fl flying to France, and when they arrive, they are being trafficked. So I just would like to mention the negative aspect of the narratives, just to, sorry, I'm the divine advocate, but. Uh, no, a very important <laughs> very point, important. yeah. Okay, so I think the first question was directed to Google, so I'd like to get Google the chance to answer. Yeah. Um, so, yes, please, thank you, Astri. Thank you for the question. Yes, we apply a human rights lens to all of the products that we launch. Uh, we consider many obligations we have, um, but human rights is a, big, is a big part of that for all of our products. Um, recently, June, Google, our CEO, um, after a very long internal process, announced seven principles around AI that Google's committed to. Um, and they're all um, worth talking about, but the one that I wanted to um, flag is, uh, and these are principles that are being applied to every product. Um, they're evolving. We, we know we're, this is a dynamic space that's going to continue evolving. We all want it to evolve. And as you said, technology is not just about technology, it's about people. But um, so, but we are um, committed to these. And they also they include things that we will not use technology to do. So we will not use technology for surveillance or for anything unlawful. This, these are guided in large part by UN principles and our commitment to those um, and inform those, and so um, applications we will not, per, you know, pursue include war or harm, um, and so or anything that contravenes our international law or um, uh, public public good. So, and hu including human rights. So, I would point you to those principles if you haven't. There's seven of them. Um, again, it was many almost two-year process to, to find how to distill those so that we could have the benefits of technology. But there's a lot, um, uh, you know, it's always evolving. We need your input. We need partners to keep, um, to keep making sure we learn in this dynamic space and keep growing and moving forward. But yes, we take a human rights lens to all of our products. Um, on the YouTube, it's a, it's a very important point that they're in, um, on, on trafficking, and I'm happy we have done a lot. Um, 
I can speak mostly to the U.S., but of course it's a global co context um, on what we've done um, to fight trafficking. We have an entire uh, one person in, in Washington actually focused on trafficking and everything that we have done to to stop um, from our own products. I mean, and I think that's what's an important point I want to make when we talk about data and the risks that come from data. Is our first approach is to make sure our own systems are secure, so that everything that we have um, and, and our the data that we have is as secure as possible. Um, and I think that's a really important part of this. I think in terms of suggestions, Marion, that you um, that uh, you are you are saying. I think um, I think there's already been some talk about principles of data minimization, um, but. Uh, which we, we've also announced, in, in addition to our AI principles, privacy principles this summer. So um, those are also worth looking at, and uh, our thoughts on data minimization, only using data um, when necessary, limiting its, its use to its most important function. Um, but I think to, for a suggestion, thinking about group privacy and testing that um, sort of best practices would be a suggestion, Marianne, I would make. Um, that's the term we would use, group privacy, but maybe there's a, a better term. But, um, but that um, thinking uh, how you can make a really context specific and weigh the benefits um, with the risks and, and how to have best practices around that. So that's a suggestion I would make. Thank you very much. Lovely. Now, other responses from we have, of course, uh, ongoing concrete suggestions. I'd like to get everyone from the panel to at least uh, offer one in their, from their view. And also, um, if you have a moment about the slow tech challenge, whether it's time to slow down and put the brakes on this crazy um, AI-driven robo-cop out-of-control car we're in, <laughs> if I'm going to put it in a really doomsday thing. But um, the slow down and the concrete suggestion. So, Jean, and, um, off you go. I'll also respond to that and also the government um, uh, collaboration question because I think that's a huge um, obstacle no matter what you know community you're in you have to work with. Uh, I think just to respond on the you know if it's like how should we think about developing solutions I think one of the things because we you know being in the digital space in the tech community here one of the things we don't see enough I think is the inclusion of um, refugees at the table like making sure that when you're designing solutions you're asking is it actually useful for them it, like you know taking very much a user experience perspective because sometimes you know there is a you know, tendency to go for what looks cool, what um, you know sounds like it you know inc incorporates you know innovative technologies. But at the end of the day, whether it's you know innovative or not, I think it has to respond to the basic need of is this actually helping improve um, you know facilitating uh, facilitating you know communication or some other function. Um, and so sometimes some of the solutions we see that are best implemented are those that are actually quite simple. To, to actually use and does not require a lot of code or does not require um, a lot of you know technical solution and I think testing those doing beta tests and making sure before you deploy because um, for example um, we work with there is a interministerial delegation for refugee integration here in France and so we work with them but you know they're launching platforms they want to launch certain um, you know tools but we also tell them you have to also slow down and think about you know testing this before you kind of launch it at full capacity because what if you see the take up rate is very, very low because of the fact it's not that useful. Um, um, so I think that's one point. And then um, a quick point about the government collaboration. I think um, sometimes it can be really down to stereotypes too. And like whether, you know, there's obviously political pressure, economic pressure um, that governments are facing from their perspective of welcoming um, a lot of, you know, new newcomers essentially. Um, and so I think what helps, and I think back to perspectives, I think it's really important to show more positive perspectives because sometimes in the media what we see in France at least is there are a lot of negative perspectives you see you know people we have Boudinville which are these basically like camps by train stations and those images are not positive and I think it fosters a very negative image in the media and so part of it is thinking about how do you transform them and keep showing more positive examples in Thank terms of also the economic productivity of the people that are coming. Thanks very much. We still need to hear from Emma and Valentina, and we have a remote participant who wants to intervene. But let's just complete our round to respond to the questions. Please keep it brief. We have five minutes, and I have a horrible feeling we're going to get kicked out of the room. So, Emma. So, firstly, on the slow tech, um, and thank you for that question. So, I would say maybe not so much slow tech as reflective and responsible and responsive tech 
which may amount to the same thing. Um, and also bringing in more voices, so bringing in the voices um, of the affected stakeholders and really involving them in the design process. Um, looking at how people are already using tech, looking at whether there are low-tech solutions, um, working with donors and funders to ensure that they are funding the right type of solutions, um, and also disrupting technology, bending it towards justice. So, um, you know, using technology in our own human rights work and for solutions that will help further the rights um, of refugees and migrants. Um, and, you know, there's this... Uh, idea about technology being magic and people are, can often be quite critical about that but I think technology actually can be magic if we work collaboratively um, and if we are reflective about it um, and then on the concrete recommendations um, yeah so basically to continue the discussions around global standards on these issues um, and to make sure that refugees themselves and migrants and the advocacy groups that represent them um, are setting the agenda um, in these discussions and that we frame data protection and innovation as mutually reinforcing um, and not as in contradistinction to each other. Thank you so much. It's really helpful. And Valentina, because oh, we'd like to hear from the remote participant, but Valentina, just to okay. finish the round. So I will just echo, I think that the use, a responsible use of data, but there are two, two corners. One is the corner of the user because there are many people that collect data on refugees and there is no reflection. Oxfam has done, uh, and the engine room has product uh, and reflect about responsible data, how that is collected, what, uh, what should be the policy, because people use their own phone, and they take pictures, they take information, they take things, and then share. So there is no, if we don't go from the higher level, the expert level, the understanding, a company maybe will think, but then the user, and the user can be the NGO, international also, the UN officer, if you do not have a real understanding of what means responsible data, those data are all over the places. This is one thing. Then I would talk about the social contract of auditing all these things. And the auditing has to be done by refugees themselves, civil society, because also we really need to understand that it's not, uh, it's not an issue between the governments, because government most of the time criminalize criminalize refugees. So we cannot have this idea of uh, hosting, happily ever hosting uh, government. So we really need a third party, and the third party are the party themselves involved, the refugees, and their allies, who they recognize as their own allies. If then we have audit of the tools and audit of the process, then we have something. One thing about the positive narrative. Yes, we can produce positive narrative, but until we are in a click economy, the top news will always be the one that will continue to criminalize. So we have a discussion that we really need to do how news are indexed and how what is pushing there up. Because we can create narrative, but if the narrative are not pushed up on the top, they will stay on the bottom, and no one will know that the majority of the world is done with people that are really good people. Thank you so much. Very concrete suggestions. We have lots to report. I'd like to, even if we cannot actually answer the question, even if we have to end our session on a question, let's hear from our remote participant. Thank you. It's a, it's a very practical question. So it's a question from Ruth Henel, who says, I have an immediately practical question from Kurdish asylum seekers in Bristol, UK. Given the ongoing conflicts in northern Iraqi Kurdistan with Google Translate, be introducing Kurdish Sorani. Sorani. Oh, Kurdish. Kurdish, Kurdish Sorani. No, 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 what was the last word? Sorani. Kurdish Sorani. 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 So that brings us back to the issue of complexity and nuance, that even large language groups have dialects yes. that need um, specific tailoring. Um, yeah, I think this has been an incredible uh, session. I'd like to thank our, our panellists for the high standard of contribution, very concrete suggestions, very clear challenges to governments and corporations. Did you... Yeah, we would just want to throw some questions to the panel, which of course they're not going to be able to, to answer now. Oh, okay. But just for the, for the record of them. Yeah, I think so. Let's just have another round of questions to the panel. Nobody's kicking us out yet. So I think some people, um, just questions. I think this is an open topic. We need to end on an open note.
So, so it's more questions go. Um, name, yeah. just so uh, my name is Jean Francois for the IO Foundation. So it's more about uh, throwing the questions for reflection itself, more than maybe getting answers right now. So um, are we training the dev teams who are behind uh, those those software development products into actual human rights themselves? I'm not talking about the policies of the, of the uh, companies, but actually they themselves as coders. Do they have any human rights training? Uh, are we bringing those members of those teams to the field to see what they are trying to fix and what is the actual outcome of the products that they are developing? Do they I get to have an emotional connection to what they are developing? Um, are we integrating any of those refugees to the development teams and themselves? Are we training them to begin with? Are we training uh, refugees to become coders so they can become part of the teams to get into, into the solutions? And are we running hackathons with them? Or is always the same people from the tech companies who are just trying to figure out again solutions from the outside? Thank you. Any other questions to end with? I think that's a great way to end. I think, thank you very much. I think, I'd just like to thank you all once again. Um, the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet um, engages with many of these topics and companies like Google are taking them further. Amnesty has got itself right on track. Um, visit our booth, which is right at the very, very back, just behind the wonderful African stalls, if you come in that way. We have some copies and we have some pamphlets. Keep up the good work, everyone. Thank you so much and have a uh, bonne journée. Okay, au revoir.